this video, I'm going to be talking about what is a FIFO inside of an FPGA and how to use it. So let's get started. Basics. FIFO stands for first in, first out. There are There's an entrance to the FIFO, which is where the write data goes in, and there's an exit from the FIFO, and that's where the read data comes out. Things go in one at a time. You can send one piece of data into the FIFO at a time, and you can read one piece of data out of the FIFO at a time. The FIFO has a width associated with it, which is really just the width of the data that you're writing in. So it could be a one bit wide FIFO, two bit wide, three bit wide, however, however wide you need your data to be. Um, and then there's a depth associated with the FIFO, which is the maximum number of words that can be stored inside the FIFO. It's not the number that's currently stored, it's the maximum number of, of words uh, or data, data pieces that can be stored. So if you multiply width times depth, you can get the total number of bits that the FIFO uses. Make sense so far? Let's continue. So when might you use a FIFO? FIFOs are used all throughout FPGA uh, designs. Um, they're used, here's a few examples for, so storing a row of video data. Video data is often like 640 by 480, uh, 640 pixels wide by 480 pixels tall, for example, 1280 by 1024, any standard resolution that a camera might put into your FPGA. You need to buffer up one row at a time and maybe do some operations on it. So you might use a FIFO for that. Um, you can, FIFOs are great for that. FIFOs are great for receiving data from a high-speed serial interface. So maybe like PCI Express, for example, or any high-speed uh, transceivers that you might be using on some of the higher end FPGAs that have some of those features. Um, you need to shove data from the high speed interface to your local clock domain inside your FPGA. The FIFO is really a buffer to act uh, between those two clock interfaces. If you need to send data to some software, to some microcontroller, you need to buffer up some, some UART, some uh, universal asynchronous receiver transmitter bytes. That's what UART stands for and ship them off to software uh, to do like some basically a COM port stuff. You can use a FIFO for that. Maybe maybe you have some, um, I've done this before for video applications where you have rows of data that you need to operate on, do some math operations on it. And so in order to align the data correctly, you might use a FIFO for that. Buffering data to and from a memory interface like an SRAM or an SDRAM interface, definitely FIFOs there. In general, a lot of these touched on, on it, but a uh, big usage is crossing clock domains. So if you have uh, data being generated in a, in a 60 megahertz clock domain and you need to cross over to a 40 megahertz clock domain or an 80 megahertz clock domain, FIFOs are really good to put across the boundary between two clock domains. So that's a, that's a big usage there. So um, it's a little bit too detailed to talk about how to use a FIFO in each one of those situations. Those are all very unique and interesting situations. Um, but I'm gonna talk in general about how FIFOs work. So in general, FIFOs can be made up of either registers, flip-flops, inside of your FPGA, or BRAM, block RAM. And I did a video on block RAM, so if you haven't, if you don't know what block RAM is, definitely go check out that video uh, before you continue with FIFOs, because block RAMs are a big part of FIFOs. Um, you know, in general, register-based FIFOs are small. Block RAM-based FIFOs are the big ones. Uh, so small meaning like. If you have a FIFO that's more than 32 words deep, so the maximum of 32 things in the FIFO at any given time, you shouldn't be using registers anymore. The reason being is that you're just going to use up too many of your flip-flops inside of your design. So your flip-flops, you only have a certain number of them inside your FPGA, and if you start putting, you know, taking 4K and just creating a, re a register-based FIFO, you've used up 4,000 flip-flops, you might blow out of flip-flops immediately. But you can store, if you have 16K block RAMs, you could create a FIFO with just one block RAM. So, and you have maybe 150, a few dozen at least of block RAMs. So um, in general, in general, most of my FIFOs end up being in block RAMs. Every now and then if I have a really small one, like a UART, maybe if I only need to queue up maybe 16 words to send to software, you know, 16 words deep, eight bits wide, that's small enough, 16 times eight is small enough that I might just put that into registers rather than using up a block RAM. It depends. There's width and depth, which I explained. Uh, here's a big one. FIFOs are synchronous pieces of logic. And if you don't know, synchronous means they are clocked. 
So there's a clock on the read side of the FIFO, pulling the data out of the FIFO, and there's a clock on the right side of the FIFO, pushing the data in. Uh, the clock can be unique or it can be shared. In general, if you're crossing clock domains, you, you have two unique clocks on the read side and the right side. If you're just buffering up data for, for uh, you know, you got some stream of data coming in and you don't need to use all of it right now, you need to use a little bit, some of it later, um, then you want to use a shared clock. Uh, that way you don't have to worry about crossing clock domains, which makes things a little bit easier. And, uh, you know, one thing, one thing to be clear of is that FIFO is first in, first out. And uh, what, that, what that means, and I didn't explicitly say this, is, is that the very first word that, comes, that gets written in on the right side is the very first thing that comes out of the read side. And so if you write 10 words in on the right side, you can't access the eighth word before you've pulled out the seventh word, and you can't access the ninth word before you've done the eighth one. So the first word is the first one out, the second, one's the second word in is the second word out, third word in is the third word out, etc. You can't access them arbitrarily in any order you want. If you do want to do that, that's what a dual port memory is for, which again, go look at my video on block grams and how they work, and you'll get a better idea of how to use a dual port memory for, for that, because a dual port memory uses addresses to, in, to index into uh, arbitrary addresses throughout your FPGA. FIFO is just, don't care about the address, give me the latest thing. I should say the oldest thing. It's the one that's been in there the longest. Okay, there's two golden rules. If you obey these golden rules for a FIFO, you're gonna be fine. If you disobey these golden rules, your FPGA design will do very strange things, and I've seen it before, and actually I know what it looks like now, but it basically looks like when you expect real data to be in your FIFO, you just read out garbage. It looks, looks, like, it looks like random letters and characters being shoved into your FIFO. If one of these two rules is disobeyed, that's what happens. The two rules, never write to a full FIFO, Never write to a full FIFO, meaning if you have a depth of uh, 1024 words possible and, you, and there's 1024 in there, if you write that 1025th one, you're gonna write to a full FIFO, that's gonna cause a bad situation and your FIFO can go off into the weeds and be unrecoverable, unrecoverable error. So don't do that. Also, never read from an empty FIFO. An empty FIFO is one where you have nothing in it and you try to suck something out of it. You say, give me the latest data, but there's no data there. So what does it give you? Who knows? Um, oftentimes, garbage. As long as you obey those two rules, you'll be good. Let's talk about how the FIFO works from a signal perspective. So again, there's a write side. That's the side that's pushing the data in. The read side's pulling the data out. But there are signals that go in and out of the FIFO, depending on what the operation is. So uh, they're, like I mentioned, FIFOs are synchronous, so they both sides have a clock. It can be a shared clock or it can be um, unique for each side. On the right side, I use DV to mean data valid. So whenever you wanna write something, you put a one clock wide pulse on write data valid. You put whatever word you wanna write into the FIFO on write data and it gets sucked into the FIFO, pushed into the FIFO. On the uh, right side, there's also these two, these are called flags here, the full flag and the almost full flag. These two flags are extremely important. Uh, they basically indicate a little bit of status back to the FPGA designer, the code, what's going on with the FIFO. You don't always know how full the FIFO is. Um, there are ways that you can get the exact number that, of data that's in the FIFO, but I'll tell you now, don't do that. You only need to use these, really just one flag, but if you can be using two of these, you'll be fine. Uh, full and almost full on the right side. And on the read side, you have read enable, which is a pulse that for every, every time your clock goes high, if read enable is high, it'll pull the latest word out of the FIFO. Again, don't read if your FIFO is empty. So you can use the empty flag to check to see if your FIFO is empty. And when you do that, you're gonna get some data on, out on read data. Um, and I usually, you know, especially when you're first learning about FIFOs, it might almost be worthwhile putting the right side and the read side in two separate files. Like this is the code that controls writing to the file. This is the, uh, to the FIFO. This is the code that controls reading from the FIFO. And the FIFO is a barrier. And there's literally, you can draw a dotted line down the middle of it. And neither signal, neither of those two files should ever need to talk to each other because they should be operating independently. 
Um, and you can make that work as long as you obey the two rules of FIFOs. Um, so almost full and almost empty. Those are usually, full and empty are pretty self-explanatory. Almost full and almost empty are usually settable um, depending on the FPGA architecture. So you can set them to be, sometimes they're dynamically settable too, so you can change them on the fly. Uh, but usually it's like, if there's 20 words in the FIFO, it's almost empty. Or if there, if it's 1024 deep and you've written a thousand, it might be almost full. And that can be used to your advantage. I'll get into a little bit more exactly how that works. Uh, but here are some general tips about FIFOs. The two golden rules, never write to a full FIFO, that's called overflow when that happens. Never read from an empty FIFO, that's called underflow. Um, you know, a general tip I have is figure out how to write code using almost empty, almost full, A-E-A-F, empty and full flags. If you figure out how to write efficient code just using those four flags, you need to spend some time thinking about it, you'll, you'll be extremely successful. I mentioned before that FIFOs have a level count associated with them. Usually a lot of FPGAs will be like, here, here's this handy thing. You can figure out exactly how many words are in the FIFO so you know how many you can read out. Don't use it, it's evil, it's evil. I've never seen it work well, ever. There's always something that goes wrong. Um, it's just, it's a bad idea. You don't need to use it. It's like a crutch. Um, so they'll say, you might have a 1024 word deep FIFO and you can, it'll say like, oh, you have 301 words. You go, perfect, I'm gonna read 301 times and you'll read an empty thing and it'll just send the FIFO off into the weeds and it's unrecoverable. Don't use it. Um, so you, you might be thinking, okay, Russell, that's great. How do I use these flags? It's not extremely easy, it takes a little bit of practice, but it depends on the situation. If you have a FIFO where you can pull the empty flag to know when there's something in it and then just suck the latest word out and shove it into something else, that works fine. You might have a situation where data is coming out too quickly to you to, for you to be able to pull that flag and just sit there and spin it and spin in a loop and just pull that. So then you have to use almost empty. So for example, okay, I started talking about this and I'll tell you. So almost empty, let's say you have a 1024 deep FIFO and you say, okay, I need to know when I can read some stuff out. Well, I. I can't read, I want to read in chunks. I don't want to just read one word at a time. Like, look at empty, read a word. Look at empty, read a word. Because then you can only get 50% of your clock cycles used to suck the data out of the FIFO. Not good enough. So if you have a, a high bandwidth operation. So you can use almost empty. Um, let's say you set almost empty to 16 words. So you, if, if, if there's ever at least 16 words or more, almost empty will be not almost empty, right? It'll be saying, I'm not almost empty, I have at least 16 things. Then you know, reliably, that you can read, you can hit the read enable 16 times in a row on 16 uh, clock cycles back to back to back to back and get 16 words out of the FIFO immediately. Then on the 17th clock cycle, you can go back, check the almost empty flag and see, is it is it still, not almost empty, are there still at least 16 things? Let me go read another 16. And so you can really get a much higher uh, percentage of your clock cycles being used to suck data out of the FIFO if you use almost empty. Same situation with almost full. If you know that you have at least 16 words available to write into the FIFO, it's not almost full, then you can write in bursts at a time. And that's really how memory interfaces work um, that's really how high-speed serial interfaces work. A lot of those examples that I gave previously, that's the methodology I use all the time and it works great. So again, don't rely on the FIFO level count. If you, if you can get away with just checking the empty flag, look at empty, suck a word out, look at empty, suck a word out, look at full, shove a word in, look at full, shove a word in. That's great. The maximum throughput you can get using that is 50%. Um, 50% of your clocks can be used to put data in or read data out. So keep that in mind. Okay, FIFOs can be created in three ways. You can instantiate them, and this is the same thing I described this in the block RAM tutorial, same thing. Instantiation means that you, you literally like say, create this FIFO, which is this wide and this deep here. And um, not all FPGA tools support this. 
Xilinx used to support it. I think they got rid of it. Lattice supports it. Uh, depends on who which architecture you're using. Uh, you can infer FIFOs. Inference means that you you write your VHDL or your Verilog in such a way that the tools go, oh, I know what he's trying to do here, and they give you a FIFO. Um, I recommend you do that. And a lot of the a lot of the FPGAs will they'll tell you exactly how to do that. So they'll give you a memory usage guide. Take a look at that. It's the same one for the block RAMs. And there's usually a section that talks about how to infer FIFOs. So give that a shot. The third way is the GUI tools. So if you're a brand new beginner, you've never used a FIFO before, this might be the way to go. You know, the GUI will walk you through exactly all the different things. And the nice thing about this is you can see what knobs you can turn. So take a look at that. One other tip, if you have first word fall through, it's fantastic, use it. If you don't know what I'm talking about, Google it, look it up. Xilinx supports it natively. If, you're, if your FPGA vendor doesn't support it natively, you can write wrappers around your FIFOs that allow you to do first word fall through. Makes your life way easier. I like it. Um, it's not necessary, but it makes things easier. Oh, FIFO. Yeah, so you can. I've created a register-based FIFO, um, and I put it on nanland.com, so give that uh, a look. It's in, I just have VHDL created right now. I didn't do the Verilog one. I'll put a link to this in the description for the YouTube video, but there's uh, two versions. These are inferred FIFOs, because I didn't instantiate anything directly, but these can be used across a lot of different FPGA vendor tools. Um, one without the uh, almost full, almost empty flags, and another one with almost full and almost empty flags. And this gives a little description of how to how to set the generics up correctly, how it works. Um, so give, if you want to take a look at how to infer, oh, this is a register-based FIFO. These are both register-based, meaning they're not block RAM-based. Um, they're, they're small. But it's good to take a look at that. And that's it for FIFOs. So uh, I really appreciate you guys, uh, all your support. The best way to keep me making these videos is to purchase a Go board if you haven't done so already. There's tons of tutorials for the Go board and it's the best way to keep, uh, keep everything chugging along. So I appreciate your support if you've already bought one. If you haven't, check it out. I'll link to that in the description as well. Thank you.